For this pigment of the month for Pigments Revealed International, I introduce to you the manganese family. With Light Attack Sand, a special focus on PB33. Surprisingly, I didn't have a video about this yet. So here is manganese blue PB33. It is one of my most precious pigments that I have, and actually one of the pigments I have most of as well. Uh, which is a weird combination, looking at it, since it's been discontinued since the 1980s. Being able to find a decent supply of it, I took advantage of that opportunity and I stocked up. Um, I bought quite a lot of it when I got the opportunity, since it is, for watercolor paint, a very beautiful and unique pigment. It is the closest pigment to a cyan and the granulation is absolutely stunning. So really uh, for watercolor paint, there isn't a pigment like this in the blue range of pigments. As you can see here, it uh, wets quite easily with the palette knife. Um, but since there are, you know, quite a lot of large pigment particles, it needs some mulling to really get a beautiful dispersion of paint. So uh, this pigment, like this, uh, you can already see the beautiful sky, uh, cerulean-like color. It needs some mulling, but even that is, is going to be quite easy with this, as with most manganese pigment. Not all of them, but most of them. As a pigment itself, it is made out of uh, manganese, obviously, and it looks like this in its rough form. So how was it made? Um, it's a process that involves the oxidation of manganese sulfate with potassium permanganate in the presence of sulfuric acid and barium sulfate. Uh, this results in this beautiful pigment, but also it gives quite a lot of uh, environmentally hazardous uh, waste, toxic waste. So for the pigment itself, it's not as toxic as uh, people think it is, although it's really you know, unhealthy um, to inhale or uh, ingest, but especially the toxic waste that it produced is the main issue of uh, the discontinuation of this pigment. So the toxic waste and the disposal of the toxic waste, the uh, problem that that gave. Uh, so. Uh, that's why it was continued in the late 80s, uh, beginning of the 1990s, and hasn't been made uh, ever since. There are some versions that kind of are a uh, reborn, renewed version of uh, the pigment that are on the market, but uh, they do look different from this cyan-like vivid blue pigment that we see here. Then how come that I still have so much of it and uh, you can actually still buy it from some suppliers or some resellers uh, online. Um, well, the pigment itself isn't that special when it comes to other media. So oil paints, acrylics, uh, they lack the uh, property of granulation. And it's, it's mostly that that gives uh, uh, this pigment kind of the edge uh, when it comes to watercolor paint. Uh, that beautiful and heavy granulation uh, because of the, the large uh, pig, uh, pigment particles and, and the heavy pigment particles as well. Um, it doesn't have that in, in oil paint or acrylics. You can easily get a hue very similar uh, with a phthalo, cyan, uh, blue and, and white, for instance. So, yeah, it's mostly a special pigment when it comes to watercolor paint. It is expensive, though, if you find it as a pigment uh, or as a paint. So, you know, I have to say that, uh, yeah, it is quite expensive if you want to buy it from my shop. But uh, um, if you find it as a pigment, it is quite easy on one side to, um, to identify the pigment. Uh, it is very, very convenient if you have an example uh, next to you. So if you have the real thing and um, you, you want to sample it next to each other, um, you can kind of get every doubt away, but the weight of this pigment uh, per volume, it is so much more than any other blue. Uh, also the granulation and, and the, uh, the, the vividness 
of it uh, when it swatches like this. Yes, you can get something like this with Dela Blue and White, uh, but it doesn't granulate and it's staining and it's a very light mix. Uh, although people can get very close and do sell fakes, so be aware of that. Um, this is manganese blue, a beautiful cyan blue, but there's more manganese blues. The latest blue in our family is Yinmin blue. It was discovered in uh, 2009 uh, by accident by uh, Professor Mas Sub Romanian uh, and his team at Oregon State University and it is the first inorganic blue pigment discovered in over 200 years. Um, why is it such a, a special thing? Also, mostly when it comes to watercolor paint, but also a, a more technical uh, uh, application, uh, industrial coatings, for instance. It, uh, first of all, for watercolor paint, it is very granulating. Um, it is a very blue pigment, uh, one of the bluest pigments, although some people say uh, ultramarine blue looks bluer, but it reflects the least uh, other wavelengths than blue. Ultramarine blue reflects quite a lot of uh, uh, warm wavelengths, so uh, reddish wavelengths. This one doesn't. It absorbs most UV, so that's why it's very interesting as an industrial coating, making it uh, suitable for energy efficient coatings. So it is a very special pigment uh, and it is non-toxic, which is really interesting. Um, uh, you know, looking at it, it is the same family as manganese blue, but it, uh, the process of making this is just completely different. A beautiful blue pigment. Then we have manganese violet. It is discovered in the mid 19th century and it is the first violet pigment that was both stable and non-toxic, making it quite an important addition to the range of available colors for artists and manufacturers. Not only for art, but also cosmetics. It's been used for that since the beginning and still is being used uh, for that purpose. The development of manganese violet filled a significant gap in the palette of non-toxic pigments available for artists and manufacturers. Before its introduction, many violet pigments were either unstable or toxic, uh, limiting their use, especially in applications involving direct contact with the skin. So that's the cosmetic part. Manganese violet provided a safe, stable alternative that could be used in a wide range of applications without health risks. It is a very uh, recognizable hue uh, depending on uh, the medium and the way it's been manufactured but as the others it is granulating and it's a beautiful pigment to work with. Then we have PBR8 which goes by a lot of names including a manganese brown, raw umber, castle earth, van dyke brown, uh, you name it, all kinds of different colors. It is a very warm, deep, dark brown color, and it's a combination of manganic hydroxide with manganese manganide. It occurs naturally, but uh, commercially uh, as a product, it is usually a synthetic version that we get because of the uh, purity and the consistency of the color that we want for a pigment. As you can see here on the slab, it works very, very differently uh, than the previous three manganese pigments I made. This is kind of hydrophobic, not really hydrophobic as you can see, but it uh, rejects water a bit more. The pigment particles are finer and it is as a pigment, as a paint, it is uh, less granulating than the others I just made. It's well, it feels different, uh, it works different, but it's still part of the manganese family of pigments. And it is one of the browns that it gives us, um, as you can see later on in the video. The pigment particles are a lot finer, as I noticed on the slab during mulling as well. And it looks a, lit a little bit thirstier as well. So it needs a little bit more binder uh, uh, for it to really work into a smooth, paint. It eventually worked, as you can see here, uh, in a beautiful dot. And, you know, it is still quite an easy pigment to work with. Next we have PBR 43. A little less known of all the pigments that I'm going to show, I think. It is a synthetic iron manganese oxide. Uh, and the iron is kind of recognizable by the uh, red color of this pigment. 
uh, but it also goes by the names of burnt sienna or raw sienna depending on the way it was manufactured. Ironies manganese brown or ironies manganese oxide as this pigment goes by uh, it is a very uh, opaque red almost like uh, an Indian red but uh, slightly more to the scarlet side uh, uh, pigment that well it, it is a beautiful color but I think uh, looking at alternatives of PR 101s um, it is not something you would see a lot of times as a single pigment. Then we have PY164. Yes, it looks brown, but no, it's not a PBR. It is a PY. In my range of paint, this is what I call manganese brown. It is a much more recognizable brown than PBR8 was, um, but it is not maybe the right term for this. The correct term for it would be manganese antinomy titanium buff rutile, which makes more sense when we put titanium to the title because um, it, it acts like a titanium pigment. It acts like a buff titanium or a uh, typical titanium yellow PY53, for instance. It is opaque. It is uh, quite, you know, uh, it is almost pastel-like as a as a pigment, um, as a paint that it produces, and there's not a lot of um, a color shift when using the dry pigment towards the uh, the paint that we're using. So it it reminds me of any titanium pigment that I have in my range. On to the blacks, PBK 14, manganese black. It occurs naturally as a pyrolocyte, uh, but commercially available pigments are usually when it's not you know named after the uh, natural material uh, it's usually a synthetic mix of manganese ores uh, it also goes by uh, black umber cement black or uh, manganese dioxide it is a, a very a deep grayish black it is not a perfect black that will be the uh, next pigment in my opinion um, but it is a very uh, dark neutral gray that uh, that it gives you and it's a beautiful pigment although not something that I would uh, offer I think in, in my line of paint I'm not sure looking at it it's quite neutral maybe I will who knows up next is PBK 26 spinal black uh, or manganese ferrite black a true black so uh, what do I mean with you know a true black it is something that really doesn't reflect any other wavelengths than just you know barely nothing uh, it absorbs most wavelengths um, uh, making it something that is closest to a perfect black I'm not saying the blackest black since you know that is something um, th that is completely different and you can't really buy that from you know any regular supplier of, of pigments but this is something that really um, gives you a feel of a true black when it comes to uh, watercolor paint or any medium that you mix it with uh, actually but watercolor paint uh, and gouache I think um, would also apply to that give you a matte finish uh, which really enhances the the blackness of this uh, beautiful pigment so this is something i do offer as a paint but uh, currently only in quarter pens since black isn't really used in watercolors a lot and a little goes a long way with this one so here's a dot of it the blackest black that i offer and as the last pigment I have iron manganese oxide PBK33 it is a uh, synthetically mixed manganese oxide with a minimum of 58% of iron oxide so that's that <laughs> it gives you a, uh, a, well, a warmer black than the previous one um, it is still a very dark dark and um, uh, I wouldn't say staining but um, a tinting pigment and it just you know 
is a really uh, nice addition to this. Um, it's not like I have three blacks that uh, uh, look very much alike. Um, I'm going to show you swatches of these later in the video, uh, but this is, well, less neutral than the previous two, obviously, as you can see here already, I think. Um, but it's also the last manganese pigment I had in my collection and uh, is part of the list of manganese pigments, the manganese family. Here I'm going to swatch the pigments next to each other uh, in the same order as that I just made them. Manganese blue to start with, a very uh, vivid cyan-like blue as you can see. The bluest blue that I have, Yinmin blue. Then we have this beautiful manganese violet, PV16. Uh, Van Dyck brown. Castle Earth, or whatever you want to name it, manganese brown. Iron manganese oxide here on the on the slab and uh, on the paper, as you can see, very similar to uh, Indian red, as I just uh, said before. Uh, my manganese brown, the titanium version, the very opaqueness that you see on this swatch here. Then we have PBK 14, manganese black. Uh, as you can see here, that neutral gray I was talking about. Spinal black PBK 26. And iron manganese oxide. Uh, it's kind of still, you know, it's, it's too shiny. They're all wet and I'm just making manganese mud here in the palette. Uh, just, you know, having a look what that does, uh, looking at the opaque uh, and granulating pigments combined with each other. So here's the manganese mud giving a warmish gray and the rest of them with the dots I made of them. Uh, if you're interested in the dots, let me know. I can make a custom manganese dot card for you. Just send me a message and I'll, uh, well, we'll figure something out. Here is manganese blue uh, under the spectrometer, a beautiful cyan peak over there. We have yinmin blue under the spectrometer, giving, uh, well, a lot of blue wavelengths, but also a lot of the rest uh, as, as, as a straight line, because it's quite transparent. Manganese violet, a lot of red wavelengths, uh, uh, as well as blue ones. Here is uh, Castle Earth, a warm brown, as you can see, slightly going up towards the end of the uh, spectrum. Then, obviously, a very red one. This will be a cooler one. Uh, a little bump in the red wavelengths, a neutral grey PBK14, uh, giving us slightly less blue than red, but uh, quite a straight line. This should be quite straight and low, there we go. And we have PBK33 iron manganese oxide. Not much of a difference when it comes to the uh, spectrometry, but uh, in this watch you can clearly see the difference. And the mud, neutral but warmish, as I said earlier. I hope you liked this video, uh, the entire manganese family for you, a little bit late as I am um, saying in the description, uh, uh, but nonetheless, here it is for you. I hope you liked it, uh, give it a thumbs up if you did, uh, give me a follow if you don't already, and hopefully see you very soon.